Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Nick Randall with Technical Toolboxes, and today we have David Willoughby, who's got over 40 years of experience within uh, the HDD space and actually quite literally wrote the book on HDD. So got a great webinar for you, kind of covering some of the fundamentals as well as how we can you know, solve some of these problems with software. Um, there's going to be a lot of content here, so I think the ask is uh, there should be time for questions at the end. Uh, there is a question pane on the right-hand side of your uh, GoToWebinar interface. If you have questions throughout the webinar, feel free to just put those questions into that pane, and we will get to them as time permits at the end of the session. So with that, I will hand it over to David. David, take it away from here. Uh, thank you, Nick. I'd like to welcome everyone to today's uh, webinar. Like I said, today we put an hour to get very uh, detailed, but I do want to give you a good introduction, and you see the kind of list of topics I'm going to focus on in today's agenda. We'll talk a little bit about feasibility, uh, the different phases of HDD, we'll talk a little about design approach, our actual drill path design, including things like tolerances, accuracy, talk a little bit about stress analysis, and then uh, I'm going to give you a little demonstration of just a couple of things that we can do in the HCD power tool uh, uh, to assist you in when you're analyzing uh, uh, your drills. And again, we'll we'll close out with a question and answer uh, uh, period. Uh, I did write the book, one of the books anyway, but uh, I think it was published in 2005. So it's been out there quite a while. But when I wrote the book, there wasn't a whole lot out there on directional drilling. So um, Right now, today, there's a lot of material on the web, different places you can get it from. So I'm certainly not uh, uh, marketing my book. <laughs> in fact, most of what's in the book, you can get for free on the web. But it, it still sells pretty good. McGraw-Hill sends me a check twice a year, so I guess they're, they're pretty happy with it. But I do give you my contact information there, both my email and my cell phone number. I am retired, uh, and uh, I still do teach classes with Technical Toolbox. Uh, I do answer a lot of questions. That's why I give you my contact information. If you have a question on it, you can send me a text, send me an email, and I'll, I'll answer your question. I, I don't do uh, projects anymore though, but uh, I'll be glad to help you out. If you have any particular questions, feel free to contact me. Um, now, again, I'm going to kind of focus on it at an introductory level today. Uh, try to cover everything that I do and explain in enough detail. You certainly have a good understanding of it. And at the end of it, we'll talk a little bit about other training that we can do that if you want to get more in-depth uh, uh, training or knowledge in some of these subjects. First thing I want to talk about is feasibility. And that's the first thing we look at when we're looking at a, a, a crossing. When we won't go and do a, 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 a trenchless crossing, usually we'll get uh, something from the client. A lot of times it'll be in the form of a, a Google Earth map or GIS map. and They'll have a line across an obstacle, you know, maybe a water body or a highway or a wetland or whatever. And they'll say, we want to cross from point A to point B and we'd like to do a horizontal direction of drill. So one of the first tasks that we have as drilling engineers is to ter determine the feasibility of that crossing. And let me, uh, before we get into it, just uh, make a point right here. One of the big problems we have, have in the industry is, is a lot of uh, people trying to do drills that should never have been attempted to start with. And then people wonder, why did it fail? Why do we have problems? Feasibility is key. What you want to do is, is don't attempt to do those drills that, that shouldn't have been attempted to start with. And uh, that can be a pretty significant number. Uh, one of the last projects I was involved in before I retired was about a 400 mile pipeline project with the client wanted to do about, uh, if I remember right, 40 some HDDs. And it was through the mountains, through a, a rough terrain. And they sent us the 40 crossings that, that we want to do drill and do your study. And those 40, at the end of the day, we only recommended where we could drill about 15 of them, if I remember correctly. So a very small percentage because of that rough mountainous terrain. But, but just keep in mind, all drills aren't doable. So, so you, you want to make sure you give a feasibility an adequate thought. Now, projects are different. Every crossing you do is going to be a little bit different. What, what we do when we go do a crossing is we're negotiating obstacles. You know, that's basically what we're doing. And some of them are very simple, very straightforward to negotiate. Some of them are, are very complex and, and require a lot of effort, a lot of work. Now, a lot of them require very extensive surface and surface surface investigations. Now, this right, this, excuse me here, the surface, oh, my thing jumped on me. 
the service investigation is one of the first things that we do because we can do it you know quickest with less expense to the owner so when, when i get that uh, uh, map with a line saying i want to go from point a to point b one of the first things we do is just do a map recon we'll, we'll zoom in on the maps and look and, and and look for areas that we might can put a drill rig and other uh, areas we can do a pipe fabrication and pull back and, and we find areas that are suitable for that because if we can't do that then we can't drill so what, once we find areas that are suitable yeah you know, then we'll do more detailed surface work we we'll usually go to the site and do some field work and gps in the different terrain uh, features and obstacles and things of that nature come up with a with a preliminary geometry that we're going to use you know, you know to make that crossing and then once we do that we'll, we'll, we'll go into some le level of surface service investigation and i say some level because it'll vary it, uh, sometimes we'll, we'll get very in-depth uh, uh, test holes and, and things of that nature sometimes we'll just use information we have but we always want to get some idea of, of, of what the surface surface conditions are uh, down there during that feasibility now again depending on the, the complexity of the project depends on you know uh, uh, the, the complexity of the design and, and again some projects are pretty straightforward some, some uh, uh, require a pretty good knowledge of hdd now the level of the, of the airflow what what drives how complex is it, it, it is is this bullet right here you see the site conditions they're key uh, if you look at this picture on the right that's pretty easy it? you got a nice uh, uh, roadway there and a the shoulder a nice place to put the rig out and do your work no problem at all but i'll show you a picture later on where, where you're on a site where you don't have any level ground and you know, a very hard place to put a rig you have to do a lot of site work maybe even clearing maybe even leveling so you know the site conditions will have a big impact on the complexity of, of the engineering design effort uh, the soil formations will have a big impact on it and what kind of soil you're going to be in of course the terrain are you in level ground are you in swamps you're in wetland are you doing a coastal drill uh, in the mountains i mentioned that project earlier about in the mountainous terrain can be very critical to be able to get up and get down uh, uh, with your your crossing existing utilities another key factor and of course uh, equipment setup restraints you got to have room to set up that surface equipment if, if you can't set your rig up if you have no place to fabricate and pull in pipe then, then you can't do an hcd okay and then the other thing you want to make sure in your flexibility, uh, excuse me, during your feasibility is that you have a little bit of, of flexibility. Uh, any good HDD uh, uh, crossing is going to have some flexibility because in most of the drills that we do, we wind up having to change the final bore path a little bit from what we designed because of gearing problems, you know, soil conditions. You know, some things will happen to make us kind of modify that, that crossing a little bit. So, you know, if, if you've got the contractor, you know, coming up in, in one space and, 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 you know, this drill right here, if, if you had him coming up right there, hit that spot, well, what if he can't hit that spot? Well, what if he needs to make it 100 feet longer because he couldn't steer up fast enough? You know, again, you like to have flexibility to allow, to, to allow them to do things like that. Uh, and again, it's a, a very, very important part of, of the feasibility analysis. If you have a drill that has no flexibility, Sometimes we'll still uh, tackle it, but just keep in mind that's a high risk drill. And you know, if you have a problem, you can really get into uh, expensive uh, correction methods. <clears throat> now, when you talk about feasibility, there's several feasibility issues that we look at during a drill. I, I don't have time to discuss them all today. Today, we're going to focus on what I call technical feasibility. And by that, I mean, uh, uh, can you do it with today's equipment? Uh, uh, today's tools, downhole tools, uh, today's means and methods by the contractors. You know, can you do it regardless of any of the other uh, uh, considerations like cost and contracting and things like that? So we're just focusing on, on the technical uh, aspects of it. Now we've gone along, we've come a long way. The first drill that I ever did was in 1986, if I remember correctly, um, and it was about a 400 foot crossing with a, with a six inch steel uh, uh, petroleum pipeline. And man, that was just really stretching the, the limits. We thought, you know, we, we thought we were getting ready to do a moon landing or something. You know, today, today that would be nothing, right? That, that's a simple drill. Today we, we do drills in the thousands of, of feet. So we've come a long way, but we still have limitations. We, we can't do everything. And, and we have equipment limitations. Uh, uh, we have cooling uh, limitations and, and we have limitations on our contractors' abilities on what they can and can't do as far as steering and things of that nature, okay? So let's talk about those just a little bit. Uh, but we have limitations on the length 
that's always a, a, a major limitation. And the diameter, how big of a hole can we put in the ground? So, you know, those are some limits we have to deal with. Now, our, our drill rig today, our drilling equipment, thrust the drill pipe. And what I mean by thrust, you know, it, it pushes against the, 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 the drill uh, bit against the soil, puts that thrust. And as, as it's pushing, the drill rig gives it the torque or the rotation and it rotates. And with that thrust and that torque, you know, hopefully we, we can penetrate and, and, and put a hole in the ground. Now, there are limitations on the amount of thrust and the amount of torque as well that we can apply to the drill pipe. And, and if we exceed those limitations, then, then, then we can, you know, damage the drill pipe. There's also uh, uh, limitations uh, uh, on steering as we get longer and longer with our drills. Uh, you know, we, 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 we lose the ability to push that drill rod without rotation. Now, if you're not familiar with how we steer in directional drilling, the, there's, there's two basic things that happen during a directional drill. One of them is called making hole. And when we're making hole, the, the, the drill rod or the drill pipe is rotating. And as it's rotating, the bits are rotating, of course, it's cutting a hole through the formation. Now, when we're doing that, we're not steering. We're, we're just making a hole in whatever direction we were pointing in. It don't matter what angle or, or where we're at, but whatever we were pointing in at the last point, we're making a hole in that direction. Now, when we want to steer, we stop the rotation and we angle our downhole tool and we'll push. So the contractor actually, actually pushes the drill rod and, and, and uh, puts that thrust on it. And he'll try to deflect that bit to do a steering. So he pushes without rotation. Now, when you push without rotation, that, that's a lot higher friction load than, than when you're rotating. So when we get a certain distance out, depending on the kind of soil we're in and whatnot, a, a contractor has a very hard time pushing that, that, that drill pipe, all that drill pipe in the ground without rotating it. So again, that's limitations on how, that's why we can't just go, you know, 10,000 or 20,000 feet with a drill because we can't, we can't do that pushing without rotating. Okay. Now we also have limitations uh, over uh, pullback. So both during the ring, when we're reaming the hole out, how much force do we have to pull back through that ring? And during the product pipe pullback, when we're pulling our product pipe in the hole, how much uh, 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 pullback we have uh, to, to handle. So again, that, both those have a limit on the length uh, of our drills. Now, a lot of times when we're looking at feasibility, uh, uh, we can answer a lot of these questions pretty quick. The more experience you have in HCD, the quicker you can answer a, a, a lot of them. And, you know, because so based on your knowledge of, of, the, of the project is key, every project's different. Where you're at, the project area is critical. You know, the, the area's gonna have a big impact on some of the feasibility analysis. Of course, your equipment, your technology, and of course, those practices. Uh, we try to determine those very quickly. And basically what we're trying to do is make sure it's feasible without wasting a bunch of time and money for, for the owner uh, who is paying for that project, okay? So we'll try to answer as fast as we can answer. If, if a drill is not feasible, I want to tell my client that as soon as possible. I don't want to wait till we spend a lot of money and say, oh, by the way, this isn't feasible. I, I want I want to rule it out as quick as I can. And But but there are those cases where you have to do a lot of work and, and, and extensive work to, to you, you kind of go down a checklist and everything checks off till you get to the you know, very uh, very end, and then you hit a showstopper. You know, sometimes that happens, and nothing you, nothing you can do about that. So let's look at the pilot hole for just a minute. We talked about the limitations on, on the pilot hole. Now, when you've got the pilot hole, of course, we're looking at our drill pipe. We're not looking at the product pipe, just the drill pipe, and and, and we're, we're drilling the hole in the ground. Uh, uh, whatever our design, whatever path we have it going. Now the drill pipe has the ability to handle uh, 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 bending, torsion, and compressive loads. Now uh, our drill pipe is called API drill pipe. Okay? It's kind of like your API line pipe. It, you can get it in different diameters, different wall thicknesses, you know, different grades. And, and depending on what kind of drill pipe your contractor is using, uh, uh, you know, it, they'll have different classifications for, for bending, allowable bending stress, torsion, and, and compressive. OK, so uh, uh, that limits us. We can't what, we, we can't put more bending in the drill pipe than it can handle without overstressing the pipe. We can't put more torsion or, or more uh, a thrust uh, th than the pipe can handle. You see this illustration right here is a good illustration. Why I show it as he's thrusting against that formation. The drill pipe will, a lot of time will want to flex the higher that uh, uh, thrust load gets. And, and you wind up getting bucking like this. I call that S shape in the pipe. 
And again, you'll have that a lot of time when you drill pipe, but if you exceed what the pipe can handle, then, then you can have a failure in, in your drill pipe at those points, okay? Most of the time, our failure will happen somewhere around the joints where the pipes go together. Now, your drill pipe is all uh, joints, uh, screw joints. We, we screw them together, and, and uh, uh, the joints are always a little bit more thicker. They'll give them more strength, but still a lot of time, that's where we'll have a failure. I've already mentioned earlier the ability to accurately steer the bit. That's the key thing on the limits of length. As I get farther and farther away, I can't do that pushing without rotating. And, and so, so as I get farther, that has a big limitation on the ability to steer the bit. And then the ability to maintain the hole. And I just call that the law of averages. <laughs> the longer the drill gets, the more you're apt to lose your hole somewhere along that drill path. Now, when, we, when you hear somebody talk about losing the hole, we don't mean that you lose the entire hole. I've never seen that happen in a drill. But this is a drill right here. And, and I lost a hole right here that's, that caved in, that's losing the hole. And, and, and anytime you lose the hole, you, that's going to increase your, your, your friction loads and whatnot on the pipe, and again, give you a, a higher chance to overstress your pipe, okay? So again, we need to be able to keep that hole intact. Uh, and the longer you get, the longer the drill is, the more chance you're going to lose the hole somewhere along that path, okay? Just a couple of photos, drill pipe can fail. You can see this one right here. You look at the edge, uh, you, you can see what, where it's, this, this pipe here actually broke off during the pile hole. And, and uh, again, you see, you see the illustration of it right here. Again, this pipe was overstressed. Uh, 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 the way this one here broke off looks like probably a torque issue, but, but you can't overstress your pipe. And if you do, it, it, it'll break just like any other uh, uh, pipe wheel if you overstress it. Now, during reaming and pullback, of course, now we're, we're, we're when we ream or pull back, we're rotating the whole time. There's never any push steering, right? It's always just pull and rotate, pull and rotate. Uh, uh, so so uh, uh, we have different considerations there. So we can pretty much ream and, and do pull back over any length that we could do a pilot hole. So that there's not really any, any limitations on length the, the, uh, uh, during the pull, ream and pull back because you have already exceeded that limitation during the pilot hole, so, okay? So the only thing we have to focus on during the uh, ream and pullback, again, is the ability to keep that hole, keep the hole open. So we have to keep either an open hole or we have to maintain what we call a fluid condition. The difference is an open hole is, is kind of like in rock, cohesive soil like clay, where the hole will pretty much stay intact regardless. The fluid condition is when you're in soils that won't stay intact by themselves and our mud in the hole helps keep that hole intact and keep the hole open. So if we lose that hole, then of course we 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 can uh, uh, you know ha have have problems. Um, and I'm trying to see. Let me see here if I see. Okay, if you look right here, this right here was was a 24 inch steel pipe pulled out of the ground, and and you can see it collapsed. Right now, this right here is that same pipe in the hole. Now look at it this way right here. You can see how it's collapsed like that. that. That's the part right here you're looking at. This right here is a swab. And again, now what happened that pot? We it, it didn't come out of the ground. We said, oh man, look what happened. We lost a hole. And when we lost the hole, of course, we had to pull the pipe real hard to get it out of the hole. And and we caused the pipe to collapse. So the, the product pipe collapsed. So that can happen too. Like I showed you the, the drill pipe damage, you can you can damage product pipe. Uh, now the big difference is. This here can happen a lot of time during the pilot hole, and it'll happen while you're going on, and a lot of time it'll surprise the contractor. You know, the 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 bit will get stuck on something, or, 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 or you know, and, and he'll twist it off, and and you know, kind of catch him, and he has to try to get everything out of the hole. Most of the time with this right here, we know long before it happens that we're stuck because we'll start losing fluid flow, and, and we'll quit. We won't have circulation on both sides. If we get an idea, we lost some hole, but again, that that can happen to you. Okay. So a lot of things you want to consider when you're looking at the feasibility. And I've already mentioned, just to recap, the site survey, that's usually the first step. That's a significant part. Uh, make sure your site survey includes some level of both surface and surface surface investigation. And the key thing is right here is make sure that your crossing is tailored to your site. Every crossing is a little bit different. And, and one of the biggest enemies in HDD is rules of thumb. Rules of thumbs will get you in trouble in a heartbeat in HDD. So make sure that, that, that you, when you look at your crossing, you, you specifically tailor everything you're doing uh, uh, to, to that site. And we've learned that if we do that well, then we really lower our, our risk. 
we never eliminate the risk in a drill. If anybody tells you they've eliminated your risk, you, you might want to hire somebody else. But, but what we do want to do is, is lower that risk. And the, the more effective you are doing your, your feasibility considerations and look at what you're doing, uh, again, you can really uh, uh, lower that risk and, and, and give you the most effective means of managing those risks. Again, I say manage them, not, not eliminate them. Okay. These are the last things that uh, uh, we, we try to look at. If you don't do a good feasibility uh, analysis, you, you can have all these right here. Of course, the big one is that one right there. Over, you can have project failure and, and uh, uh, not be a success to do, do your project. So we want to, to do the feasibility and, and our goals of the characterization. Again, I give you a whole list of the goals here you, you can have. But the big thing is right here. We want to be able to analyze the effectiveness of HDD in the anticipated conditions that we have, especially the subsurface conditions. Okay, so the, the, those are your main goals of, of that characterization. Come up with a good alignment. Identify all, all the features in the vicinity of the drill path. Uh, uh, identify your surface and subsurface conditions. Uh, the geology between the two points you're drilling at. And again, analyze those surface and subsurface conditions and come up with a good cross. And, and, and that's the main goal of, of the feasibility. Now, a lot of people call feasibility a preliminary design, and that's okay. It's the same thing. Everything you do during the feasibility analysis or the preliminary design rolls right over into your final design. You don't have to re redo anything. So re really, for, for, for some of your more complex crossings, most of the work goes into the preliminary or feasibility uh, phase of the project, especially if you don't have anything come out uh, uh, during that it causes you to make any, any major changes. So now let's talk a little bit about the phases of HDD installation. Um, see right here, it's usually three-stage process, and I say used because there are some exceptions to that, but probably 95% of the time it's going to be a three-stage process. And of course, stage one is the pilot hole, and I'm gonna, I'll, I'll go reach these in a little bit of detail just in a minute, but uh, stage one is the pilot hole, and again, uh, stage two is the ring, and sometimes the ring will include a swab pass. We call that swabbing. Not always, but so sometimes we'll have a swab pass, and then stage three, the final stage, is, is, is the pullback. Okay? Again, we'll cover each of those here in, in a little bit of detail. Let's talk about the pilot hole for a minute. Now, the pilot hole, you go out there, of course, and, and, and you know where the pipe's going into the ground. You get you got a pre-designated point, uh, and you got a stake there, so that's pretty easy to hit. <laughs> and you're going to launch right there, and you're going to drill that pilot hole and negotiate the obstacles. And I say that plurally on purpose. Most drills will have more than one obstacle. You might be going under another utility to start with. That's your first obstacle, and then you're going under you know the, the edge of the right of way or edge of pavement. That's another obstacle, and Maybe you have a, a, a road crossing or whatever. A lot of time we'll have multiple obstacles that we have to deal with. And uh, uh, so the pilot hole is, is what we launch and, and we proceed along that drill path and negotiating those obstacles. Now we go in with a relatively small drill string and, and a you know, uh, API drill pipe can go anywhere from, from uh, you know, a couple of inches, you know, up, up to uh, six, eight inches in diameter, depending on, on how big the rig is and, and what you're doing. Uh, drill bits, again, they can go from small up to, I mean, you can get drill bits real large. In HDD, we normally don't use a drill bit larger than around 14 inches, and that's because of weight. As the bits get that big, they get heavy, and as they get heavy, a contractor has a harder time steering those back up to the surface. So normally, the bit size is going to be, you know, 6, 8, 10 inch in, in that range right there. Uh, but again, we, we, we'll launch it, that, that pilot hole, and we'll negotiate those obstacles. Uh, we'll go in a, a angle, normally somewhere between 8 and 16 degrees. Uh, typical people start with 12. That's a very common number you'll see people use. And if I'm going into rock or, or very hard soil, uh, we'll go with a steeper angle because we want to be able to penetrate that rock easier. And it's easier to penetrate rock at a sharper angle than a shallow angle. Sometimes we'll go steeper if we're trying to, to get deep quicker. The steeper the angle, the quicker you're going to make depth to get down. So, uh, But normally somewhere in, in that range. Uh, right there. And uh, again, during the pilot hole, uh, uh, we, we we have our steering, and I've already mentioned this to you, but we have that non-rotating drill string. 
I told you earlier, we, 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 it, anytime you see the contractor rotating that drill rod, he's making hole. When he's going to steer or, or have his directional capability, he's going to stop rotating and he's going to push without steering. He, he does that by having an asymmetrical leading edge or a bent assembly, and, and that enables him to deflect his drill bit in, in, in a, a desired direction and, and do steering. That's what makes HTD different than other trenches technologies. Uh, it, it's the only one that we can steer you know, while we're drilling you know, and, and, and try to hit uh, certain targets. Now remember, HDD, uh, excuse me, the pilot hole is where all the steering takes place. There's no other phase of the drill where we steer. The, the, the ring, the pullback, we're just pulling through the hole that the pilot hole created. Keep that in mind. So steering only takes place during the pilot hole. Now I mentioned to you about how we steer. So again, if we stop rotating, uh, if you have a, what we call a tricone bit, like you see right here, these are tricones, they'll have a bent stub assembly. And, and, and all that is, it, it's an assembly that has an angle in it. Normally, it'll be something three degrees or less uh, uh, with the angle. And, and what he'll do is he'll orientate that bent stub so this bit is, is pointing off in, in a direction. Now remember, this is a small correction, uh, three degrees or less. And, and then what he'll do is he'll push without rotating and he'll, he'll deflect off in that direction. Once he makes a steering uh, a correction, then he'll start rotating and making hole again. And you see the same thing down here. And this example here, he'd be going down here are the bent stubs down here, and he'd be going up a little bit, okay? Now, if he doesn't have a comb bit and he uses a spade bit like you see here, we call these steering blades. So this, this doesn't have a bent stub, it's all straight, just go straight. But what he'll do, he'll orientate that, that blade in the direction he wants to steer. And the example here, if he orientated this way and he pushed without rotating, again, uh, uh, it, it's gonna, direction of drill is going this way, the soil is gonna push down this way, it's going to deflect the bit down. Again, he could turn that uh, up if you want to steer up or left or right in any direction that he might want to steer in. <clears throat> During the pilot hole, uh, uh, again, that's where all the steering takes place and that's where we do our tracking and locating. Again, this just takes place during the pilot. And, uh, we have a, a drill bit transmitter that's down in the downhole tooling, uh, depending on what kind of tooling you're using, but it'll be somewhere behind the drill bit. And that's what sends out the signal up to the surface that the contractor picks up to give him both his location and his steering corrections, his pitch, his roll of the bit, and everything he needs to steer that bit. Okay. Now, another key thing to notice on the pilot hole, it's different than the other phases, you've only got a one way flow of mud because, again, you're drilling along the design path. And so, so mud has to flow back this way. So during the pilot hole, you, you have to put, a, a, usually requires more pressure in the hole to keep that mud flowing. And you also have a smaller angular uh, hole that, you know, again, ha has a higher uh, a loss of head. So a, a lot of time when we do our borehole stability analysis, we have to focus real close on the pilot hole. That's usually the worst one uh, 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 for fracking out, okay? And I said usually, not always, but 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 it usually is, okay? Um, so again, uh, he'll steer as he does it and, and do a steerage correction. Once he punches out, of course, he'll take his drill bit, bit off and uh, going to the next phase, okay? The next phase is reaming. Now, this is where we're going to enlarge the hole. You see this right here, there are a lot of different kinds of reamers. Uh, uh, this right here, was, a, if I remember right, was a 48 inch uh, uh, fly cutter is what that was. But it, it, let's just say you've got a, a 10 inch drill bit. So you got a 10 inch hole, that's, that's the pilot hole, right? And if you're gonna pull in a 24 inch pipe, then we got to ream that hole out big enough to pull that product pipe back through the hole, okay? So that's the reamer. This right here is the reamer. You see, this is the product pipe right here. Get me to pull it in. That's the reamer. Now, this right here is called a swivel. Now, remember, I told you during the, the reaming and pullback, the contractor's always rotating the drill rod. He never just pulls, he's always rotating. Now, you don't want your product pipe to rotate. You want it to just pull. So that swivel takes all the rotation out so the product pipe uh, won't rotate. Now, how big a hole do you ring? A lot of discussion on that. I'm sure if you've been around, you've heard the one and a half rule. That's very common. And, and, and that works well in most situations. So it's very common we'll say one and a half. So if I've got a you know, a 12 inch product pipe I'm gonna pull in, I'd ream out an 18 inch hole. Okay, that, that's, that's a very common rule. Now, be careful though, especially with your smaller pipe sizes. 
if, if for, for pipes that are smaller than eight inches, uh, I recommend that you use a reamer four inches larger than the pipe diameter. Or is that one and a half rule didn't give you a big enough handler space? Let's just say you got a four inch pipe. So you use the one and a half rule, that'd be a six inch ream. So you've only got a two inch handler space. And, and, and that's not adequate. We, we always want to have at least four inch handler space in there. So that's why for the smaller pipe, we, we would use a, a reamer four inches bigger that, than, than the pipe. So for that, for that six inch pipe, I would ream out a 10 inch hole at least. Okay. Now, when you have pipes of eight to 24, that one and a half rule works real good. We use that pretty much all the time, unless soil conditions or something will drive us something else, but that's the most common number we'll use. Now, once your pipe gets bigger than 24, now there's nothing technically wrong with using the one and a half rule. You, I mean, it don't matter. All you're doing is making a bigger annual space, but it does drive up your cost. So what we recommend, if your pipe's bigger than 24 inches, just use a reamer 12 inches larger. So, so if you know for that 24 inch hole, I'd have a 36 inch reamer. You know, you know uh, uh, for you so said I would just go 12 inches big for a 36 inch uh, uh, hole. You know, I'd go 50 or 48 inches bigger. Yeah. You know, so, uh, uh, and that's that's strictly a cost issue because the more you have to ream it out, the more it, it's going to cost you. Now, most of the time, we do what we call pull reaming, as you see here. So we we attach the reamer right here, and the contractor pulls it back to the rig. We call that pull pull reaming. Now, there, there are some cases where we'll do push reaming. And usually a contractor does that to control his mud flow. If, if he wants most of the mud to come back over here, he, he'll put the reamer on right here. And he's reaming the same way, but what he's doing, he's pushing the reamer in instead of pulling it back to the rig. So again, you don't see that as often, but you will see that occasionally if you ever see a contractor doing that. Now notice this picture right here, you see that the reamed hole, of course, is the size of the reamer. The hole up here, of course, is the size of the drill bit. So you got a bigger hole, so you'll have a lower head loss back here because you got a bigger hole for it to flow through. Again, here's a reamer right here. This right here is called a swab. I mentioned swabbing earlier. Uh, uh, swabs we usually use on uh, uh, the larger pipe. Uh, I recommend any pipe bigger than 20 inches, you always require the contractor to swab the hole. Uh, there's nothing wrong with swabbing anytime. But, but all swabbing does is clean the hole out and, and help you get all your stuff out of that hole and make sure you can uh, 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 pull your pipe through it. So you see right here, the difference in swabbing. So if this is my ream right here, so you see I'm cutting out soil, okay? Now, if I'm swabbing, I'm not cutting out any soil. So, so normally what a contractor will do, whatever size he reamed the hole out to, his swab's gonna be usually around two to four inches smaller in size than, than the last ream. Because again, the purpose of the swab isn't to cut any more hole, it's just to clean any cuttings that might have dropped down the hole and just, just clean the hole out, okay? So the bigger the hole, the more chance you've got of having stuff in there is why for 20 inches and above, we, we always want to swab. And again, there's nothing wrong uh, with doing it at any time. There's two ways you'll see contractors swab. Sometimes they'll, they'll use a swab like you see right here. And, and that's this picture right here. Yeah. Sometimes they'll just use another reamer. A bit, again, but they'll use one a little bit smaller than the, the last reamer they did for cutting out soil. But again, because they'll push mud through and again, try to clean the hole out that way. Okay, pull back, uh, again, a straightforward. Uh, we, we're gonna, once we pull out of the hole, we're gonna attach the, the, the pipe to the downhole tools. There's a swivel I mentioned to you earlier. So we take the rotation out of the pipe. And of course, we're gonna pull the pipe from, from the, the pull side back to the rig. Now we like to, to fabricate the pipe in one continuous string on the other side so we can pull it back in one pull. We can't always do that. Sometimes we have to break it down into sections and pull it that way. So, you know, so that can be done, but we, we try to avoid that uh, if we can. Just illustration to pull back. Again, I told you sometimes pull back can get pretty uh, uh, critical on, on the uh, uh, borehole integrity. You're, you're fracking out. Because again, even though you got a bigger hole here, you got a bigger product pipe in here. So a lot of time that you have to increase your pressure to keep that mud flowing. So most of the time the pilot hole is the most critical condition, but sometimes pullback can be challenging uh, as well. Okay, let's talk a little bit about our design approach, some of the basic principles for design. Uh, again, you need to have a, a good knowledge of, of what you can and can't do with your, your drilling equipment. And uh, 
you quite often when people have problems, it's because that they try to do something that, that the equipment is not capable of doing, or or contractor is not capable of doing uh, uh, with, with his means and methods. Okay, so uh, you know when we do our design approach, it's typically again we got to negotiate the obstacles, and we we want to meet all the requirements of the project of the owner, and and try to keep the project uh, cost as low as possible. Now a lot of things impacts the cost, the kind of soil you're in, diameter of the hole. Uh, all those things can go into cost, but the main factor that, that covers cost that the, the designer has any control over is the length. And so what I mean by that is, is we never make a drill any longer than we have to. Now, there are exceptions to that. If you're drilling in an area, especially some of the urban areas where you have a lot of concrete, a lot of asphalt, uh, sometimes the restoration can get very expensive. So if you get in those situations, sometimes it's cheaper to keep drilling than it is to come up and, and, and do trench construction with those very high restoration costs. So again, like I told you earlier, every project's unique. You have to consider uh, every project. So what we want to do during, during our design, uh, again, we want to come up with our plans, our specifications. And uh, again, we'll come up with uh, some type of scale mapping that the contractor can use uh, during construction. And also the engineer can, can use uh, uh, during uh, uh, his design as well. And make sure your drawings include all of the utility information, the other utilities you're crossing. Any obstacle the contractor's got to negotiate with, you want to make sure that those obstacles are included in, in, in your plans. Uh, any improvements, that, that's a big one. If you're crossing a road, highways, are there any highway plans to widen that road, to put in a new bridge, something that would make your pipe be in the way? We always want to look for that during our design. If you're drilling under uh, 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 water bodies, are there any plans in the future to widen that water body or, or, or make it deeper? I'll always look for those. Uh, right of way information, key. You make sure you know where the, the property boundaries are. The last thing you want to do is get in somebody else's property. Owner had to wind up paying a, a big penalty or, or redo it. So make sure you get that in there. And of course, we'll put our soils information in there uh, as, as well. All right. When you're crossing other obstacles, and especially if you're in somebody else's easement, and 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 they give you a, a requirement to be a certain distance below their structure, maybe maybe you're crossing another pipeline. And hold on, you're crossing another pipeline, and maybe their their uh, permit to cross that pipeline said you had to be you know ten feet below below their pipeline. Now remember, when when you when you draw that dash, dash line, yeah, if this is your crossing and, and you see this line, that first line, that line represents the pilot hole. So that pilot hole went in there at this diameter right here. That, that's what size that drill bit was. So that's what size that pilot hole was. So if you measured from this from this uh, other utility down to that, you know uh, uh, that's okay during the pilot hole. But what happens when you ring that hole out? What happens when you pull your pot pipe back through there? Because the, the, their requirement is for you to have that distance from there, you know, during all phases of that construction. So make sure when you do your pilot hole, if you've got to be, you know, uh, 10 feet below that, then, you know, if this is a 24 inch pipe, then, then your pot hole is going to need to be, you know, 12, 13, 14 feet below that of the utility to make sure that, that you do that. So I always consider those reamer and, and, and uh, pipe diameters. Uh, when you have your clearances. Same thing when you got your setbacks on the roads and things of that nature. I always consider the, 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 the full diameter of the hole, not just the pilot hole. Don't forget the ground profile. Quite often, if you're drilling on level ground, it's pretty straightforward, but, but, but a lot of time you, you, you might be drilling and, and you might be Somebody's got a timer on this. Oh, oh, give me a second right here. I'm gonna see if I can cut this timer off here. See if I quit, quit jumping on us. Okay, well, to, a lot of time your ground will have slopes like that. So if, if your exit pits up here, 
when, when you start you know, drilling, you you got to fight that slope to get back up to here. So that's what we say when I'll always consider the geometry of the ground, the terrain, and and, and all, all that can have have an impact on it. <clears throat> now, our drill paths. We design our drill path is made up of a series of straight lines. We call those tangents, curves. Now your curves can be a sag bend, they can be an over bend, they can be a side bend. Uh, it all depends on the actual plane. Uh, you can also have you know, side bends would be your, your, your left bends, your right bends, uh, uh, your, your over bends you know, is when, when, you, when you bend down like that, your sag bends when you bend up like this. So again, you can go in, in any of those planes that we need to. Again, all we're doing is negotiating obstacles, right? So, so we'll have our straight lines called tangents and we'll have those curves that, 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 that where we need to go, do to negotiate obstacles. We also can use compound bands. I don't have time to get those in detail, but that's when we, we turn in two directions at one time. So we do a left, uh, uh, go, go left and up or, or, or left and down. You know? So we, we can do those as well. Right. So again, when we do our drill path design, we're going to define those entry points, define our exit points, negotiate the obstacles, and then we'll come up with the straight sections, the tangents, the, the curvatures, everything we got to do to negotiate those obstacles. We'll put those on our, our drawings, and, and, and again, that will be our pilot hole design that the contractor is going to steer to when he when he drills that pilot hole. This is a typical what you'll see for HDD. Yeah, this entry angle, and again, this is the pilot hole. So the entry angle is that's where the rig's at. And I told you that rig, the, that rig will incline up, and you can set it you know, in whatever angle he wants to go in at. And uh, yeah, so let's just say he goes in at 12 degrees. That's very common. So he goes in at 12 degrees. So so this first section right here, that's your first tangent. That's a straight section. Now wherever he's going to start steering, that's his point of curvature. So in this case here, he's doing a sag bend. Here's your point, that's where the steering in. So from here to here is a sag bend. Now this is coming back to horizontal in this illustration. So that sag bend is gonna be the same angle as this right here. It'll, it'll be a 12 degree sag bend. Doesn't have to be by the way. If this if this straight section doesn't have to be horizontal, you know, it's, it's still a straight section, but it might be going down at an angle or up at an angle. So you, know, you might come in at 12, and, and, and you might do a, a eight degree uh, a sag bend. So if I did an eight degree sag bend, then the straight section would be straight, but would be going down at four degrees. That's how the geometry works. And we do that quite often. Again, when we're fighting the, the terrain, your slope's going down, things of that nature. So you can, you can do either one of those. So here's your first tangent. Here, here, here's your a sag bend. Here's the straight section. And again, a lot of times that'll be the longest part of the drill. And here we got a sag bend. But now again, uh, uh, um, we're going up. You're know, starting to come up. And again, here's here's your straight section, your tangent coming up. So your drill can be made of any number of sections you need to negotiate obstacles. It doesn't have to be one, two, three, four, five. That that's just an illustration. Uh, how many obstacles you, you're doing? You, you you might have a horizontal bend from here to here. That'd be another section. You know. Uh, so uh, what you have to do when you draw that pilot hole is negotiate obstacles that's that's the trick uh here's an example right here you got, you got both the, the plan view up here and then of course we, we've got the uh the profile down here so when you go out there and negotiate obstacles uh you know if you, if you look right here you can see those contour lines and uh that actually was a railroad track right here and a housing development back here so there was no way that you could pull a pipe on on this side over here so when you did your first site survey, that was a known. Okay, we can't pull a pipe. So we're gonna to have to pull a pipe over here on this side over here. So, okay, I'm, I'm gonna put my rig right here, make sure I got room to pull thing up and then I got my rig laid out. Now, if I go along my, my horizontal view there, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't really see any, any more obstacles in the horizontal until I get to the end. Now, if you look right here, the pipeline itself has a PI right here and goes up that direction. Okay, so I've got to I've got to be able to come up before that because I got to follow that route. So now I can I can fabricate my pipe and lay it out over here. That's okay, but when I pull it back in the hole, I'll come down to right here so I can pull the pipe in. So th those those are the horizontal obstacles. Nothing that we can't do, but for some reason, if if, if we couldn't, we, we know we couldn't pull this way, 
If we couldn't have pulled this way over here for whatever reason, that drill would have been unfeasible at that location. And that happens all the time. You know, quite a lot of time you actually you can't do it. So again, once you once you make sure you can do it the, the horizontal, then you'll look at your profile. Again, so right here, your entry point, and again, negotiating obstacles. Now, right here, we got an obstacle right here. This low depression, you can see it right right here, where it got a cutout. That, that was actually a drainage swell. We're, we're crossing the Cape Fear River, so so that, that was a drainage swell for that river. So that was one obstacle. Of course, right here is the edge of the river. That's the other obstacle, because here's where you come out of the river right here. Now here's the big one right here. Right here, you got a 48 inch sanitary sewer. Again, so you got to make sure that, that you're far above that sanitary sewer, that you're not worried about not just hitting it. You don't want to frack out into that sanitary sewer because the, the, a sanitary sewer like that's uh, just push joints. It, it's pushed together. And if you get mud up in that, that trench, you're gonna, you, you can separate those joints very easy. And, and then you're going to have raw sewage leaking all, all around the Cape Fear River here. Uh, again, <laughs> that, that's an environmental problem you don't want to have, believe me. So uh, see all the obstacles there. So that, that's kind of, again, so in this one here, we, we got a straight section here. We got a curved section right here. We got a straight section right here. And of course, curved section right here and a straight section right here. But again, it could be any combination of, of what you might have, right? David, quick time check. We've got about 13 minutes for um, any sort of demo, and also there's a there's a bunch of questions. So kind of use that info okay. information. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, thank you. Let me see here. Uh, a lot of this I probably already covered. Talk about that we talked about the angles. I did tell you I show you a picture on on, on the uh, uh, product side. Remember that first picture I showed you how the rig was sitting there on nice level ground. Look at this rig right here. You can see how it's cut out right here, and, and the rig's actually put down in, in, in a hole. Uh, that's not that uncommon. Uh, again, if there's nowhere else to go, you would never do that on, uh, initially. But if you get to a place where you, you know other place to move the rig, you don't have place to move it further back. You know, we do do things like that sometimes to make it work. So a lot of a lot of things you can do to make the, the, those things work. Uh, here's the exit. Uh, again, normally four to twelve degree uh, exit angle is what we'll do. The main thing on the exit is you want to have that easy breakover support to be able to pick your pipe up and get it down the hole. Depth of cover, I cover that in detail in some of the training courses. The main thing I want you to on this right here, uh, used to we use a lot of rules of thumb for our minimum depth. That, that's outdated and I recommend you don't use that anymore. If you wind up in a, in a lawsuit, you'll probably use. The depth of cover should be governed by the definition of the obstacle and by doing some, some type of analysis to make sure that the, the soil will hold the pressure uh, in, in, in that hole. Okay, I'm gonna move all four right here and I'm gonna go to this right here because we're gonna go, everything I showed you before was, was a pilot hole. Now right now we're gonna look at the pullback section and doing uh, our analysis on the pullback. Now, when, when we're doing our stress analysis on the pullback, the uh, HD power tool uh, uh, uses the uh, guidelines set forth in, in, in the uh, PRCI horizontal directional drilling design guide. And, and, and the, the calculations, the methods, the procedures are, are, are all, all come out of that manual. Uh, first published in 95, the newer version came out in 2008. Okay. Now, the big thing about that is, is there's a lot of variables. I'm going to show you the variables in, when we look at the, the uh, uh, example. And I'll, I'll cover every bit of this when we look at our example of it. But the main thing we're dealing with is the tension. Remember, we got the tension. When you pull that uh, uh, product pipe back through the hole, you're going to have that tensile drag. Uh, that comes from the friction drag and the fluid drag. You're going to have bending when you pull it through that hole. And of course, you're going to have the, the external pressure uh, as you pull it through that ringed hole. So all those are going to have an impact on the stress analysis for, for that steel pipe. Okay. Now, when you're doing pullback, Got the same thing. Remember, our rig's over here. We're pulling back. So now we're looking at we're looking at pullbacks. So we're focusing right here. So point one is where your pipe goes into the ground. Point two is the end of that straight section. Point three is the end of that that first uh, uh, bend. Uh, point four is that straight section. Point five is this bend, and point six is coming back up. So what we do is we look at the stress in each of those sections. So we'll, we'll model the, the pull loads. And, and this section right here, 
And then we model the pool loads in this section here, this section here, and this section here, and this section here. And then we just add them all together as a summation. That's why it doesn't matter how many sections you have. You can add sections, what we got to add, and just add them all together. Okay. And we're going to look at this plan right here. So I'm going to go, excuse me, if I can get out of here. Okay, this right here is the HDD power tool. Uh, when, you, when you open it up, you'll see you've got a lot of different uh, uh, modules you can choose from, depending on what, what you have. Everything or HDD power tool is under crossings. So you go to crossings, and once you once you go to crossings, excuse me, you you come down here, and, and here's your HD power tool. And you see uh, under power tool, uh, uh, you got cables and conduits, you've got drilling fluids management, you got polyethylene pipe, steel pipe, and and, and you can choose for pull force for insulation for vertical, uh, or vertical and horizontal. And you can choose either whether you're using Google Maps to, to input the, your, your mapping data, or you can pick GIS if you're using GIS map. Does the same thing. That just impacts what mapping system uh, uh, th th that you might be using. Okay. Uh, now I've got a couple open right here. This right here is is the pull force and insulation stretches for vertical. And, and you can see right here, you, you've got your profile, and, and the profile is based on a shape file. And you can actually go in and import that from your shape file or from GIS, and, and you can you, you you draw your line what you're going to be crossing. It'll import th that actual profile for you to look at. Now this right here is your actual profile of the pipe that that, that you put in there. That is based on uh, uh, this section down here. If you notice right here, we've got a straight section A to B. There's the angle. There's the length. Uh, B to C. Again, so that's a straight section. This right here is a curved section. So straight sections are straightforward. All you do is straight section. So you can have straight, curved, or compound. We got straight. You can go down slope, up slope, or level. We're going down slope. You put in your angle that comes off your plan, and or you, and and of course the measured length, and, and that'll give you your straight section. Now for your curved section, same thing. You, you can um, you can have a curved section or compound if you have a compound bend regular again you can curve left right if you're doing a horizontal bend or down slope or up slope now you put in your angle you put in your radius and it'll calculate the measured length or you could pick measured length and you could type in the measured length and it would calculate radius which, whichever one you have is, is what that will do and so, so you have each of your sections and you can have as many sections as you have negotiating that obstacle okay there's no limit on the number of sections you can put in here so you hit you hit calculate, and it'll calculate this right here. So uh, and it'll give you the total length. In this case right here, you got about a six thousand nine hundred foot crossing is what you have. Now you come right here for your pull load and, and maximum pull force. This is where you input your pipe data. So again, you can pick from different kind of pipe. Uh, I'm using API 5L. You can pick whatever diameter you got, whatever wall thickness. Uh, select your grade. Uh, and again. Uh, modulus, portions ratio, any, any stress factors you want to use. Uh, here's, your, here's your coefficient of friction. Now, it gives you the range right over here, 0 0.23 to 0 0.3. Usually, to be conservative, we'll use the worst case. Uh, here's your fluid drag coefficient right here. Again, 0 0.03 to 0 0.05. Normally, we'll use 0 0.05 for worst case. Now, here's your mud weight. Now, that's the way of the mud in the hole. So, we'll, we'll put that there. And, of course, our water weight. and Speed things up, you hit calculate, and, and that quickly it calculates the, the weight of the pipe and the pull load for each of those sections. So you see, you got section A to B, B to C, C to D. It does each section and then just adds them all together. So your total pull load is 194, your allowable is 277. So you can see very quickly uh, whether you're good or bad. And if you want to make a change, let's just say that I thought that was, uh, uh, you know, I didn't like being that close. This is a 7,000 foot drill. So I, I don't like just having about 100,000 pounds of, of safety factor in there. So I want to have some more. So I said, okay, what, what if I'm going to use some buoyancy control? What, what if I'm going to put a little bit of water in that pipe? So I come here, I say, okay, I, I'm going to put water in that pipe and calculate it now. Now you see now 
my pull load uh, uh, changed a little bit. I went, well, it didn't go. I didn't change this right here. Yeah. Now, see, that won't affect your allowable, but but it does affect uh, what your total pull load is. Okay. Now, in this case, it made it worse because I put so much water. So maybe I come back here and say, okay, I'm not going to fill it full of water. I'm going to put about 30% of water in there. Okay. And then I calculate that. I see now my pull load went down to 170. So again, so you can do what is very, very quickly within, within these modules. Okay. And, and, and that's what the power tool does for you. Uh, you, you, you have uh, borehole stability analysis. Again, we have classes where we teach how, how to do borehole stability, but if you do it, you, you can build it here. This is the analysis for that one we just looked at. Remember that that was about a 7,000 foot drill, but, but this is every point along that drill. Now this right here is the elevation profile. Okay, so you can turn that off. Uh, this right here is the bore profile. You can turn that off. The red line is your allowable mud pressure. The green line is what's required to keep that mud flowing. So you can see your okay you get right here, and right here you have a problem. So we'd have to we'd have to deal with that problem right there. Uh, either go deeper in that area, maybe go to an intersect drill. But, but again, you see how where areas you've got to to do something to control that borehole uh, stability. And uh, it's also got a, a, a plastic pipe. I don't want to get into that, but you know, we, we've got different modules that we'll use for our, our plastic pipe analysis as well. Okay. So let's go to you some questions. Um, okay. Uh, Nick, I guess the first is for you. Will there be a recording of this webinar so we can reference it? Uh, yes, there, yes, there will. So everyone will get a recording of this uh, later today or tomorrow. Um, okay. And actually, David, could we kind of run through the last couple of slides before we dive deep into questions? Oh, okay. Let me get back to those on a second here. There you go. Very good. So I, I just want to highlight, you know, this was definitely a high level kind of overview. David uh, goes super deep on all of these topics uh, in a variety of upcoming trainings that we have offered on our website. So, you know, these these are kind of more three, four hour trainings where you do get PDHs and do get kind of certified in, in um, that content that you've taken it. Um, beyond that, you know, David gave a, a quick overview of our HDD power tool. Um, if you could advance, David. Um, so, you know, if you do want to try it, you know, we're going to just kind of put out a, a quick poll here that just if you do want more information or want one of our other experts uh, to get on the line and kind of run through this with you uh, at any given time, um, you know, just kind of give us a yes there and that helps us tailor, um, you know, setting up that up accordingly. Um, if the answer is no, don't worry, you uh, will not get a phone call and uh, we'll not get an email on that. So uh, that just kind of helps us there. Um, with that, going into yeah. questions, we'll give kind of folks a minute to vote there. Um, we do have a ton of questions. I know we're about at time. So I, I think we'll answer um, three or four here. And then, um, you know, the rest we'll try and get to offline because there, there are a bunch. So um, with that in mind, uh, first one, what parameters influence the pull force or tensile stress the most, David? What parameters influence the pull loads or the tensile stress? Correct, the most. Okay, well, several param parameters. Uh, uh, first is the length. The, the, the longer the drill is, the more length the pipe you got to pull back in. So uh, anything that adds weight to the pipe, is going to add pull load. And it's going to add, anything that adds pull load is going to add tensile stress. So, you know, the, the longer you, you get, you're, you're adding more more weight. The other thing, of course, the, the, wall, the wall thickness. The thick, the more steel you have, the, the heavier the pipe's going away. So that will increase your pullback in your tensile. Now, the other thing that has a big impact is the mud weight in the hole. Because you remember when I showed you in, in the power tool how that mud weight, uh, 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 the water in that pipe affected that pull load. So it, it, if the heavier that uh, mud is, in other words, a 12 pound per gallon mud will create a, a higher pullback load than say a nine pound. So 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 the mud the mud uh, weight will have a big impact as well. Okay. Um, next question. Can you talk about the feasibility of HTD intercept methods and pulling in with 3D combo bended pipe string lifted in the air? 
um, intersect methods, uh, I cover that in the advanced class. Uh, pretty much, if you don't know what, what intersect is, we, we, we put a rig on both sides and, and, and we drill towards each other. And, and what we do, we do that is we lengthen, we shorten the length of the pilot hole. Because remember, the intersect method only, only takes place during the pilot hole drilling. It has nothing to do with the ring or pullback. They're done the same as always. And when, when we do an intersect, then we'll shorten the length of that pilot hole. And uh, it's fairly common now. A lot of contractors have done it. It's, it's a, you know, so it, it's certainly a means and method that's out there and uh, uh, can be reliably done. In fact, that example I just showed you, that 7,000 foot drill, we actually did that with the intersect method. So it, it's not uncommon. It, it's, it'll vary from contractor to contractor, but as a rule of thumb, most time if we get more than 5,000 feet in length, most contractors will consider doing an intersect. And anytime you get up around six or seven, most contractors are gonna do that with an intersect drill. Okay. Now, what was the other part of that question about 3D? Uh, pulling in with 3D combo bended pipe string lifted in the air. Okay, I would never pull it in that way. I, I mean, I mean, I might have a 3D, or, or we call that a combination bend. Combination bend is, is you're bending, uh, 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 and really in, in two planes at one time. Like I told you, you're, you're bending uh, instead of just doing a straight sag bend, you, you're 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 bending down, but you're also bending to the left, to the right, or you could be coming up. Don't matter. But we're bending in two planes at once. We call that a compound bend. And now that's in the hole. When I pick that pipe up out of the hole, when I'm, I'm going to pull it in the hole, I might do a, a, a one plane bend on that. But 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 uh, nor, normally, I think what what he's asking is right at the hole. If if you have uh, the, the pipes, let's just say the pipes out of the ground and you've got it bent to the right because you had to bend around the opposite. So you, you're heading to the right. So you're going to pick that pipe up and get it to go down that hole. And normally, what we'll try to do is have room to pick it up make that horizontal bend, and then when we're starting to go down the hole, we're back to just a vertical bend. If you try to do both at the same time, I won't, you could do it as long as the contractor had the, the right kind of equipment to hold that pipe rigid enough that, 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 that he, he can make it do that bend. But, but again, what we normally try to do is, is do the horizontal bend and then do the vertical bend going down the hole, okay? Awesome. Any other question there? Yeah, why don't we take one more? I know we're over. And then, like I said, for everyone else, we get a recording of the questions and we will try and follow up with you one on one uh, for those. So, last question How does the HDD power tool hand pipe stress analysis for multiple pipe pullbacks? Okay, good question. When you pull back multiple pipes, um, this pipe multiple pipe is we'll have several pipes on, on, on a string we're gonna pull them all at one time now when we do that on our pulling head each, each pipe individually is connected to that pulling head okay so, so you have your pulling head here you got your swivel right here and you'll have your chain link or whatever going out to each pipe individually pull it down the hole so when we're pulling that pipe each pipe the the pipes are being pulled in parallel not in series okay so so pipe a doesn't see any pulling load or stress from pipe B or pipe C. It just sees the weight and the pulling load of pipe A. Pipe B just sees pipe B, uh, uh, pipe C just sees pipe C. Now for my rig and my rig size, we're gonna add all those together and, and that's how we gotta size our rig. But for our stress analysis on the product pipe, the way you do it in power tool, you would do the pull loads for pipe A and, and that would be the loads and stresses for pipe A. Then you'd do it for pipe B and pipe C. So you, you'd have each one of them done individually in power tool. And then if you want to know what the total pull loads were, you just add all those together to get your total pull load. Okay. Very good. Well, David, thank you. Um, and you know, thank you all for your great attendance, great questions. Like I said, um, you know, for many of you, uh, we will get back to you uh, you know, in various means. Make sure you are getting your questions answered. And uh, thank you for the great attention. And you can expect again the recording here in the next, uh, you know, next 24 hours. So with that, have a great day, everybody.